on Tuesday at 1 o'clock. The um, calling hours will be at Zem Zembruski's. Is Zembrus am I pronouncing that right? In Naugatuck, Zembruski's. Zembruski's. Close enough? Not, no, because I live in a, a very Polish town. I've got to get it right. <laughs> Zembruski's in, in Naugatuck from 5 to 7 tomorrow night. And then the service will be here on Tuesday at 1. And pray for Chris and, and uh, her daughter Elise and the, her grandkids uh, during this time. Tough couple of months. You're going to church is dismissed. So are you confused by this passage? <laughs> Good. I'll, I'll do my best to unconfuse you. Not sure how successful I'll be, but I'll do my best. Paul, in the middle of his discussion of freedom and grace, he's just told us we've, we've been freed from sin and enslaved to God. And now he says, do you not know, from speaking of those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? This is the law of God. It's not the law of the Romans or the Greeks or anybody else. It's the law of God. And he uses as an illustration marriage. He says a woman who's married, if her husband dies, she's free to marry again. She's released from the law concerning her husband because her husband's no longer there. So then if while her husband's living, she's joined to another, she'll be called an adulteress can't be married to two people at the same time. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law. It's logical, right? Makes sense? You with me so far? Does that make sense? Okay. So she's not an adulteress, though she's joined to another man. In regard to the law, he says, Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. When Christ died, the hold that the law has on us was gone. So that you might be joined to another, that is to him, to Jesus himself, who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. We have a different goal now. <clears throat> We've been released. We're dead to the law. We're alive in the spirit. It's not the letter of the law anymore, but the spirit while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. We're not bound by the letter of the law anymore. It's been replaced. It's been replaced by this, this let me call it the law of love. We obey God out of love for him. We don't, we don't obey God because there's these Ten Commandments that tell us how to obey God. They guide us, they direct us, and they show us. But the obedience to God comes out of love, comes out of relationship, comes out of caring deeply for God and recognizing that God cares deeply for us, it's a whole different dynamic, isn't it? It's a dynamic of, of relationship and love and not of law, not of the letter of the law. We've been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Does that mean we don't obey the law anymore? Not at all. But our motivation is very, very different. And then he, Paul says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? He says, absolutely not. Absolutely not. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. That's how we know. And we do, don't we? We know when we're transgressing God's law. 
for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said you shall not covet. Right? So we know when we're breaking God's law. But there's a problem, huh? See if you relate to this. Even though we know that we're breaking God's law, we do it anyway? Anybody can relate to that? Can everybody relate to that? <laughs> if you can't, go back to Romans 3.23 and start all over. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. It's interesting, Paul uses himself. As the illustration, he doesn't use anybody else except Paul. Paul calls himself the chief of sinners elsewhere, doesn't he? So he doesn't exclude himself from this dilemma. He gets a little more deeply into it. He says, I was once alive apart from the law. When the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. Not physically, but spiritually. And Paul as a student of, of the law, probably kept the law pretty closely. But he still understands <coughs> that, that according to the law, he's guilty. Still with me? Anytime you get confused, raise your hand, okay? <laughs> For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. Sin kills. The law is holy, he says in verse 12. So then the law is holy. The commandment is holy and righteous and good. He's speaking like a good rabbi here today. Teacher of the law. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? Once again, he says, anathema, may it never be. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. We know, we know, we know that we sin. We just, we know. But we do it anyway. Right? Now, sin is an attitude that says that I'm going to do what I want to do no matter what God thinks. I'm just going to do it. It's not a particular act. It, it, it results in a particular act usually. But it's that attitude saying, I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. Now this is not like the devil made me do it. This is our actions in the light of the law. Our actions that result in sin. Paul says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm a flesh sold into bondage to sin. <coughs> Excuse me. And here's the dilemma. What I'm doing, I don't understand. But I'm not practicing what I would like to do. Anybody relate? He's so human here. Paul just, just reveals his own person. But he reveals pretty much all of us here, doesn't he? You ever find yourself doing something you really don't want to do, but you're doing it anyway? I'm doing the very thing I hate, he says. We, we can see in some of Paul's letters, he had a bit of a temper. When he and Peter get into it in Galatians, it shows up. He can be a little self-righteous sometimes. He calls himself the chief of sinners for a reason. Because he understands his, his human nature. Understands his personality. And he understands sin. But if I do the very thing I don't want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. If I know that I'm doing something that I, I really don't want to do, why don't I want to do it? Because I know it's wrong. I know it's sin. So I don't want to do it, but I end up doing it anyway. 
You ever try to break a habit that you really know you ought to break? Is it easy? How come? Because I want to do it. Exactly. That's exactly right. I, I want to do it. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells inside me. He's not saying that the devil made me do it. it it's, he's saying, this is my nature. This is my human nature. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me. I, I want to do what's right. But the doing of the good is not. Quite a dilemma, isn't it? I used to work for Jan's uncle, and he used to tell me the story of uh, his sister, Bertha, who uh, the boys were fooling around in church. Imagine that. <laughs> and a Christian Reformed church to boot. And so she stepped on him. And uh, he said, oh, my goodness. And she looked him in the eye and said, you have no goodness. You know what he said? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Didn't get along all that great. But he was honest. I know that nothing good dwells in me. I know that about myself. So what do I do about this? How do, how do, how do I reconcile this? For the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I don't want. But if I'm doing the very thing that I do not want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. He's not excusing himself. He's saying, this is, this is my very nature. This is my human nature, my fallen human nature. What do I do about it? I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. Can you relate so far? Anybody? tough, isn't it? See, following Jesus is not for the faint-hearted. We, we struggle with stuff. But we struggle on a foundation that I will get to that is solid, rock solid. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. I, I agree with God's law 100%. I agree it's good. Right? God's law is not bad. God's law is not wrong. Well, you shall not kill. Good idea. <laughs> right? <laughs> you shall not covet. Good idea. Honor your father and mother. <laughs> your kids aren't here. <laughs> But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. My members. I fight with this. This is Paul saying this. Paul, who people thought walked three feet off the ground, admitting this, that this is a struggle for him, as well as for everybody else. Who's this book written to? Go back to the beginning. I thank my God. Well, first of all, he says, verse 7, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. Who's he talking to? He's talking to believers. He's talking to Christians, yeah. This is not for a pagan audience. This is, called, this is for Christians. We struggle with this stuff. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? He understands the dilemma, understands it fully, but he also understands the remedy. And there is a remedy. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why? 
why? Uh, she said, forgiveness. Yeah, you know, that, that five-letter word that means so much, grace. Right? Say again. Love. Yeah, God's love for us, right? I'm going to show you something in a minute. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind, I'm serving. Does it sound like Tevye? <coughs> and fiddler on the roof on the one hand. But on the other. That's Jewish logic. That's Jewish hermeneutics. To weigh both sides and figure it out. How, how, do, how can both things be possibly true? Because they are. Watch Fiddler on the Roof again. On the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Can you relate? This is such a human passage. We all can relate. And here's the foundation I was talking about. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you know you're not condemned, how does that make you feel? Does it make you feel that forgiveness is possible, that love is possible, that a relationship with God is possible, that victory is possible? No condemnation. That's a great foundation, isn't it? Whoever I am, whatever I'm struggling with, there's no condemnation, so let's start there. No condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus, we condemn ourselves, others condemn us, but there is no condemnation in Christ. None. Why? Because of the cross. All of our sins. For chapter 6, the last verse says this, the wages of sin is death. <coughs> I think this early spring has got me dealing with allergies or something. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin, death. The free gift of God, eternal life. No condemnation. Through Jesus Christ, no condemnation. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, he's talking about the law of death coming through, through our knowledge of sin, but he talks about a different kind of law. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. We're free because of Christ Jesus to serve him, to follow him, to obey him, to respond to his love in obedience. Because we want to, not because we have to. You understand the difference? It's not because there's this written set of laws. There is. But because of our love for Jesus, for what he's done for us. What, di what a difference does that make? It's kind of like in a couple of days, it's Valentine's Day. Guys, you heard it here. Write it down. <laughs> Tell me what the difference is here. I have to get a card. I have to get flowers. Or I want to get a card. I want to get flowers. Is there a difference? You bet there is. You bet there is. All the difference in the world. I have to obey God's law. I want to obey God's law. Is there a difference? Absolutely. It's attitude. No condemnation. It comes on earlier in Scripture. I'm going to share a psalm with you this morning. I miss the Old Testament sometimes. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. And then he lists the benefits. Who pardons all your iniquities. That little word, all, means everything. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. Does this sound a little bit like Romans 7? You bet it does. Who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. 
who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. That's who our Lord is. He's slow to anger. He's compassionate. He's gracious. One of the words you see very often in the Gospels when they're talking about Jesus and people is he had compassion on them. Over and over, he had compassion on them. People like a woman taken in adultery. People who, to everybody else in society, were considered sinners. Jesus has compassion on them. You and me. Jesus has compassion on us. He's compassionate. He abounds in loving kindness. He doesn't just dole it out. He abounds in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. That means he, he doesn't stay angry with us. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. <laughs> isn't, that a good, isn't that a good word? He hasn't dealt with us according to our sins. Boy, if he did, there'd be little burn spots all over this room. But he doesn't. I'd be the first burn spot. Nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Instead, what did he do? He sent Jesus to take on himself all of that guilt, all of that sin. He dealt with it on the cross through his son. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. Reverence him. This is not being afraid of God. It's reverencing him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I arrived at Nelson. Whenever he would preach, he would find a way to weave this in. The Lord has removed our sins from us and buried them in the deepest ocean and put up a no fishing sign. <laughs> I can still see him. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He's mindful that we are but dust. How does he know? He created us. He knows us. He knows our frame. And the psalm ends this way. Bless the Lord, all your works of his, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. He's compassionate. He's gracious. He overflows with loving kindness. And so Paul reconciles what he's telling us here about the law and about sin by saying there's no condemnation. We go before God. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, and there's that little word again, from all unrighteousness, from all unrighteousness. He's a gracious, gracious God. Because of Jesus, we're free. The law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Does that mean you can do anything you want? Yes. But there will be consequences. And by doing anything, every, anything you want, are you flying in the face of God's love? Do you want to do that? I remember when I was working in Campus Life in New Jersey, one of the, one of the speakers down there said, you know, when, when we're really free, we're free not to sin. We're not free to sin. We're free not to sin. That's spiritual maturity, my friends. 
That's freedom. We're going to meet downstairs. It's, uh, I know it's what it says in the bulletin, but I don't always believe what I read. Um, I don't believe half of what I hear. But we are going to meet downstairs uh, for a good reason. You'll understand once we get down there. But uh, as we dismiss here, come on downstairs. You don't have to be a member to come to the meeting. You need to be a member to vote. But you don't have to be a member uh, to come to the meeting. And I encourage you all to come. And those, those of you who are members, I really encourage you to come. We need you. This, you are determining next year for this church by your vote. And uh, so please join us downstairs. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the freedom that you give us. Because of you, Lord Jesus, we are set free from the law of sin and of death. So help us, Lord, to live free, free to serve you, free to love you, free to love one another, free from the bondage of sin. Help us to be your bond servants and no one else's and nothing else's. We pray in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>